Well, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. It, 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 it is Thanksgiving tomorrow, isn't it? I mean, like, did I get the dates wrong or something? Like, <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2 primarily today. Um, but, I, but I want us to start in Acts chapter 1. Um, I believe in doing things with intentionality. So, like, I don't, I don't like just doing things to do things. So there's a reason why we're doing what we're doing today, okay? Um, there's a reason why I'm going to teach for the first time sitting down in 20 years of teaching, okay? So there's a reason why we're doing all this, okay? And, um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but whenever my mom and dad, when they wanted to talk to me about something serious growing up, they did it at the table, right? They're like, we need to sit down. You remember those days? Like, we got to sit down. And you sit down around the table and stuff like that. That's what families do, right? Families sit down at tables and they have conversations. Families sit down at tables and they laugh together. They cry together. They, they have serious conversations together. And today, I, I want to have a serious conversation with you. I, I've been um, praying and fasting and uh, seeking the Lord's will over the past couple months and really trying to hear God's voice. Have you ever been there before where you really want to discern God's voice? I mean, like you're hungry. You, you, if, if God doesn't speak, you're in trouble. You ever been there before? Like you're desperate, desperate to get a word from God. You need to hear his voice. I've been in that place the past several months and really the past year and a half over a couple of different areas in my life and in our church and in our ministry. And specifically over the past two or three months, I've really been seeking God's voice about the life of our church, about Fellowship Pickering. And um, I believe he has provided some deep clarity to me in several areas that I want to address this morning, and I, and I want us to begin to implement these things as a church, okay? First of all, let me, let me talk to you about our transition. Uh, we announced nine, ten months ago that we were transitioning, and I, I know that God led us to do that. I'm, I'm not mistaken by that. Um, in previous ministries that I've served and led in, when God leads us to transition, guess what he usually does? He provides a new pastor. <laughs> so, but for whatever reason, over the past nine or ten months, we, we have uh, advertised for this job. We have talked to people about it. There's been a couple of candidates, but nothing that they felt and we felt was the Lord's doing and work. And so here we are. And so... I still believe that long term, God is going to transition my family from this role of being lead pastor. And I, and I believe eventually we will be putting more attention and oversight into my catalyst role, finding church planners, training them, developing them, uh, Bowmanville and the Fellowships Network as a broader vision and picture. I still believe that's where we'll ultimately end up. However, right now, when things like this happen, I kind of try to take a step back and say, okay, God, you know, what are you trying to say? And th over the past few months, as I keep on asking him and the more I pray and seek the Lord, I sense that he is saying before another, we're going to keep on raising up O'Dain and June. They're, gonna, they're elder candidates, and they will be pastors. They will be elders, okay, in the life of Fellowship Pickering. We're going to keep pushing that team model because I believe in that. We're going to do it. Uh, but I believe before God brings on another pastor onto this team to, to do more of the teaching and, and vision casting, I think there's some things we got to work as a church. I think there's some areas we got to get healthy in as a church. And I just want to share with you three observations, okay? Three observations about us as a church, fellowship picking. Number one, I think we're a tired church. That's why I'm sitting down today. I'm tired. Now I'm joking. I think we're a tired church. I'm being serious. I think we're worn out. You know, Fellowship Pickering turns six years old next Sunday. We're going to be six. We've helped plant four churches. We've given away hundreds of thousands of dollars to church planting. We've done all kinds of things. Church planting is hard. It's always going to be hard. It's, it's never not going to be hard. But here's the deal. Um... I was trying to think about the best way I could illustrate this to us as a church. It's, it's like the soldier who's been on the front lines. I like the term Marine better. 
But, but it's like the soldier that's on the front lines. You can only fight for so long. You got to get some relief. You, you got to go to the rear, and you got you, you to get in some new, fresh wind. You got to get some new bodies in there to carry out the fight. And I think right now we're a tired church. I think we need to enter into a season of rebuilding and resting. I think we need to enter into a season of listening and receiving what God has for us. I think we need to enter into a season of rest. Let me be very clear. We are not retreating. There's a big difference. Biblically, to rest is a good thing. There's a time where God says go, and there's a time where he says stop. And right now, we're going to rest. Let me give you an example of that. We've always done community outreach, community outreach, community outreach. We're trying to reach lost people. This is our heart. This is why we exist as a church. We're going to see it today in the book of Acts. However, we, for example, we did the trunk or treat. We're going to do the trunk or treat at the end of this month, and we're going to do that. We've done it every year, but, you know, we're, we're not doing that. We're not doing it for a couple of reasons, okay? One of the reasons why we're not doing it is because I want us to focus in more on the things that we're going to do, talk about today as a church. We all only have so much margin in our lives. You have only so much energy in our lives, and because God's calling us to rest, I also believe he's calling us to be focused, to be focused in how we rest to drill down deep into the things that we're going to talk about today, I want us to focus on those things and those disciplines. The other reason why we're not doing the chunk retreats is we just haven't had a lot of participation. You know, I'm not mad about that, by the way. You know, I'm not, I'm not angry that you guys didn't sign up or don't want to do it. I promise you, okay? Everybody has time commitments and responsibilities and all that kind of stuff. But that's just an example. I think we're a tired church. Um, secondly, I think we're a thin church. I think we're a thin. Some of us are thinner than others, amen? But I, I, think, I, think we're a, I, I think we're a thin church. I think we're a thin church. You know, people have romanticized church planting a lot, especially lately over the past 10, 15, 20 years. Church planting, church planting, multiplication, multiplication, all these things. It's glorious. It's beautiful. I'm giving my life to church planting. You know, Erica's given her life to church planting. Casey, Kelly, O'Dane. Your leaders are giving their lives to church planting, Josh, Jessica, others. But it's very, very hard. It's a miracle. You know, church planting is a miracle. To see something come from nothing, it's a miracle. It's only a miracle of God. You're a part of a miracle because you're a part of this church. But it's very, very, very difficult. And like I said earlier, we, we've given away a ton of resources, um, but it's just money. It's not our money, right? Amen? It's not our money. You, you give today, it's not yours. You're giving it unto God. It's, it's God's. Um, we've invested time, policies, procedures, energies, resources, meeting after meeting after meeting with church planners and coaching and training and all these kinds of things. But, but it's a blessing to do that. You know what the hard part is? Let me tell you the, the, the bottom line. The hard part of church planning is the relationships you have to say goodbye to. We're a thin church right now because we've sent out a lot of people. We've sent out a lot of quality people. We've sent out leaders. We've had to say goodbye. That's the hard part, right? We've had to say goodbye to people we love and that we care about. So I think we're a tired church. I think we're a thin church. I think that when I look at our church, I think we're putting a lot of workload on a small amount of people right now. I think there's a small amount of people who are doing the majority of the work. Again, I'm not mad. I'm just being real. And then the third thing is I believe we're a church lacking unity. I believe we lack unity as a church. Now, I prayed on this for a long time, and I hesitate to even say this because it could potentially sound so harsh. But the more I pray about it, the more I really feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to tell us this today. I do believe we're lacking unity. Because as we're going to see in just a bit from the Word, there are some foundational principles in the life of every church. Every church, there are foundational things that should be present. And I believe we're lacking in those things right now. I believe some of us are doing these things periodically, like time to time, but I don't believe we're doing them together. I don't believe we're linking arms, unified, taking back territory for the king and his kingdom. That's very dangerous. I feel like we have a lot of solo people right now kind of doing their own thing, and that's dangerous. So what's the answer? What's the answer to all these things? You know, in the first years of Fellowship Pickering, when people would come, I, I was so curious. I would say, hey, w just out of curiosity, what brought you here today? And they would almost always say the same thing. This place feels like a family. 
this place, everybody's so kind. Everybody's so close to one another. Everybody's so loving. They talk to each other. You know why we're doing this today and why we're going to keep on doing this? You know why we're getting around tables? Because when we flip it around and we're up on that stage and why I'm sitting down today, I want to talk with you. I don't want to preach at you today. I want us to have a conversation. And when we're in that space and as we've decreased in attendance, as we've sent people out, we've planted churches, it feels cavernous, right? It feels big and people sitting here and people sitting there and there's not that closeness. There's not that tightness. I think we've got to get back to that. I think we've got to get back to what made us unique in the first place as a church. I think that warm fellowship, that warm community, so many people have told me over the years, you know, I, I haven't been able to find that elsewhere, and I found it at Fellowship Pickering. Uh, you know, um, many folks lately, it seems like, you know, many folks are coming in late. Many folks are leaving early. Um, I just feel like we don't have that family unity like we once did. Um, and so I believe the answer is given to us right in the word. I, I think we have to get back to the basics. I think we have to get back to the basics. And I want you to hear me today. Like, please, please, please hear my heart, okay? I, I, I am not, like, coming down on us as a church. I, I promise you I'm not. I'm not saying, like, woe is us. Listen, the sky is not falling, okay? Jesus is on his throne. God is in charge. He's, he's not done with this church. As a matter of fact, I believe the best days are ahead of Fellowship Pickering, not behind. However, I think we got to get healthy in some areas. I think we're unhealthy, and I think we got to get healthy in some areas. You know, some people might not care for this. You know, some, some guys would say, I would never do what you're doing today. But listen, I've always committed myself to lead with transparency and honesty because I love you. I love you. I love you so much. I give my life for any one of you. I'm never going to lie to you. I'm never going to get up here and try to pretend to be something that we're not right now. And we need to get better. We need to get well. I've had multiple people come to me and say they sense the same things. And so let's just be honest. Let's talk. Let's get better. Let's get well. If God is calling us to do some things, let's do it. Let's not back down. Let's not the enemy take territory. Let's do what God has asked us to do. Okay? Amen. Acts chapter 1. Go ahead and find your way there. Acts chapter 1. Oh, I love this book. Favorite book of the Bible. I love it, love it, love it. It's incredible. It's amazing. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus has went to the cross. He has suffered a death that only he could suffer. He was the perfect atonement. He was the perfect righteousness. He was the only sacrificial lamb that could be offered on our behalf. And he went to the cross and he died. And everybody thought that he was gone. And the Romans celebrated. But then what did he do three days later? What did he do? He rose again from the grave. Amen. He was victorious. He was victorious. Now, if you're new to the faith, and you might not know some of these basic tenets or principles to the faith, but after Christ rose from the grave, he came back. Matter of fact, he didn't just come back for a day or two, but in Acts chapter 1, it says that he came back for 40 days. He was doing miracles and doing all kinds of stuff, and he was showing people like, hey, I've really come back, I've really resurrected, and I really am who I said I am. Okay, and so he calls together all the disciples, and he says, listen, I don't want you to leave. I want you to go to Jerusalem, and I want you to wait. And he says, you got to go there, and you got to wait, because I'm going to send you the helper, the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest ends of the earth. And after he said these things in verse 9, he goes up into the clouds, and he's now at the right-hand throne of the Father. And so what do the disciples do? They all get together. And they go back to this upper room in Jerusalem. And they're there. And they're praying, it says. They're praying, it says. It says that they're seeking the Father's will. They need God to show up. Could you imagine how afraid they must have been? 
By the way, in in uh, in, in later on, in uh, I think it's verse three or four. If somebody sees it, uh, no, verse six. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, "Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom of Israel?" They couldn't get it. They still thought it was about Israel. They still thought Jesus was going to come back and make make them great, right? And all these things. And so he tells them, "No, I want you to go away. Go stay in Jerusalem." And they go to this upper room and they're praying and they're seeking out the Father's will. They're asking him what to do next. They need. God, they need his voice, and they're doing a little bit of business, too. They elect somebody to replace Judas the Iscariot because he was the one who um, had betrayed Jesus, right, and, his, and, and, uh, and hung himself afterwards. And so all of this is going on, and they're praying. Verse 24 says, and they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show us which one of these two you have chosen. Crystal prayed for wisdom and discernment. What a godly prayer. We need wisdom and discernment. They're asking that. And then in chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had come, they're all together in one place. About 120 of them are in this upper room. They're there, and they're praying, and something powerful happens. I want you to watch this video about the day of Pentecost. Let's watch this video that explains what took place. What happened that day? When the Spirit arrived, when the Holy Spirit came, what happened then? It got loud, loud enough to be heard all over town. Fire appeared, divided and dispersed to each of them. The outsiders came running, and they heard the fire talkers tell of God's mighty works in their own language. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretans, and Arabians. The Spirit had come to describe the glory of God in their native tongues through those who followed Christ. These representatives of the world stood astounded but curious, bewildered but ready. Then Peter showed them from the scripture exactly what it meant, revealing God's promise to all who trust in Jesus. And many believed, and many repented, and many were baptized, and many were saved. The Spirit had come. The church was born. And so Peter preaches this powerful sermon on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 at least were saved. They said, what should we do? It says that they were pierced to the heart in verse 37 of chapter 2. It says they were pierced to the heart. And they ask him, what shall we do? And Peter tells them, he says, you got to repent. Repent of your sins, be forgiven, and be baptized. And they're baptized. They're instantly baptized. And in verse 41, it says, So then those who'd received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. And the church and this movement is off, and it hasn't stopped since. And what I want us to do is, I want us to start this new series today called Simple Church, and I want us to go back to the basics. I want us to go back to the basics, and I want us to see what the early church did. What did the early church emphasize? What did the early church focus on? What were they passionate about? What did they give of their time, their energies, their resources to? What did the early church do? Because what the early church did, we need to still do. Amen? The same power, the same movement that started this whole thing, listen, he is here. He is in us. If we've repented of our sins and placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he is here. He's with us. And so what did they do? Acts chapter 2. We're just going to look at verse 42 today, but I want us to read verses 42 through 47 every time we get together. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread and house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So 
Simple church, the power of a devoted family. What I want us to do is I want us to kind of take like a 30,000 foot view and I want us to look at these verses starting in verse 42 this morning and I want us to see the foundational practices that were in place in the church. So first of all, what, what was the characteristic about this church? First of all, this church was a saved church. They were born again. They were saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 42a, they were continually devoting themselves. They were continually devoting themselves. Verse 41 told us how many people, how many people professed Christ and repented of their sins. How many? About 3,000, right? That's not even counting the, the women and potentially the youth or children, that's just the men. So we know thousands of people repented of their sins and were baptized. And man, no, make no mistake about it, these people were all in. They were completely focused and co committed to the gospel and to following Jesus Christ. You say, Matt, how do you know that? How do you know these people were all in? How do you know they were committed? Because as soon as they were baptized as Jews, as soon as they said, I have placed my faith in this Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, immediately they welcomed persecution into their lives. Immediately they would have been hated. Immediately they would have been slandered and abused and put as outcasts, essentially. But they were all in. Why? Because they devoted themselves to their faith in Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus says when we continue in his word, that means that we are uh, in a relationship with him. In other words, if we obey his word, if we are, uh, are, are listening and doing the things that we're going to see today, if we're doing what he's called us to do, it's proof, it's fruit of our commitment to him. It's our devotion it's like when people say, say Matt, are, are you married? And, and I don't have a wedding ring. And they say, well, where, where's your wedding ring? I could say, well, I don't wear one because of this or work or whatever it might be. Or I could just hold up and say, no, this is a proof of my devotion to Erica, right? I'm committed to her. See, Jesus says that we continue in his word, and it shows that we are saved. John chapter 8, verse 31 says, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are what? Truly disciples of mine. John the Baptist, do you remember the story when John the Baptist is baptizing and all these Jews come and he baptizes some of them? You remember the other group? He says, you brood of vipers, who warned you about the wrath to come? Remember that? And later on, he just says, you know what? Like, I'm going to get out of God's business and he's going to sort all that out at the end. And he actually says, your repentance will bear fruit. You, if you've genuinely repented of your sins and you've placed faith in Christ and you've come here today to be baptized, John says, then it'll bear fruit. It'll bear fruit. And, and, and that's what we were learning here today. They were continually devoting themselves. They were a saved church. This almost sounds silly that we're saying this, doesn't it? Like that they were a saved church. You may be thinking like, of course they were a saved church. They, 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 were, they were Christians. They were saved, Right? But, but listen to me. There are churches all across North America that are packed with individuals who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they are not saved. They are not born again. You say, well, how can you say that? You know, who, who are you to say that? Listen, I was one of them. I was religious, and I did all these things, and just like what I'm doing here today, I stood up for six years and opened up this very Bible and preached sermons out of it, and I did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If I would have died back in those days, I would have split the gates of hell wide open because of my sin. I was an enemy of God, but I was in church every Sunday. Shoot, I was leading the church. Hey, can I even take it a step further? I think we got a lot of pastors in North America that don't even know Christ. You say, well, that's crazy. Man, listen, we don't got time, but I could tell you some stories. I could tell you some stories about some men and women who profess to be men and women of God who bear no fruit of that. We've heard lately of all these well-known pastors and Christian celebrities, you know, they're leaving the faith. And um, they'll get on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, and they'll, they'll, they'll write like this long diatribe of why they've, they've been enlightened and they've realized that Christianity is not real and all these kinds of things. It breaks my heart every time. It's so sad that when people do that. And, uh, you know, I had a friend say, well, we need to pray for these people to return to the faith. Now, listen, I believe in prodigals. I believe we get weary and Satan attacks and you go off. And I believe in the prodigal son. I believe in the prodigal daughter. I believe in prodigals. 
I believe God allows sometimes for that to happen to draw us back to him and we grow closer to him. Um, however, I would also say on the other side of that coin, I would just take us back to the word of God. First John chapter two, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Hey, how many of us in this room have known people at whatever stage in our life who, who man, they were, they were on fire for Christ. Like, they loved Jesus. They were born again. They professed Christ. And you didn't really think I was going to sit there the whole time, did you? Like, they, 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 were, they, they, they loved Jesus. They read their Bible. They prayed, all this kind of things. And you're, like, checking up on them. And then, like, a year or two, like, hey, how are you doing? Your I don't even go to church no more. Do you know? Raise your hand if that's ever, you've ever seen that. Raise your hand if you've ever seen that with anybody. How, breaks your heart, doesn't it? Breaks your heart, doesn't it? And we've even seen that in this church. We, we've seen people who come and they get so excited, they get baptized, or, you know, and we're like, it's a discipleship problem. We can't get them into stages. Hey, sometimes that's absolutely the truth. Sometimes we can't get people into stages, and that's the problem. But let me tell you something. When the Spirit falls on someone's life and He convicts and He moves, there are some fruits of that relationship with Jesus. And we got to disciple them, we got to mentor them, we got to do those things. But we got to be a saved church. Let me say a couple things before we move on this morning. Number one, people who are exploring the Christian faith, you are always welcome in this church. Always, 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 always. You're always welcome in this church. But the church, by definition, are those who have repented of their sins, placed their faith and trust in Christ as Lord and Savior, and are bonded and unified together around the things that we're going to talk about today. And what I don't ever want to do, ever, ever, ever want to do, is while I want anybody to always feel welcome at Fellowship Pickering, I don't want people not to know about the urgency of Christ's return. I don't ever want anybody to come here and never give their life to Christ and just think that you, you are a part of this body and, and, and you're going to go to heaven and you're going to be with God. If you've not repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus, I want to exhort you to do that today. Do that today. I got downstairs um, early this morning, and I don't know about you guys, but my Keurig, when I turn on my Keurig in the mornings, that thing sounds like I am lighting a furnace in the living room. I mean, that it's, so, it's like, you know, it's so loud. I probably need to get a new one or whatever. But it's so loud. It makes so much noise. And I was just thinking this morning, man, when Jesus comes back, that trumpet's going to blow. <laughs> I don't know what time of day. It's going to be so loud. Everybody's going to know he's coming. The church, this church was a saved church. This church, secondly, they love the word of God. They love the Bible. Acts 2, 42b, it says, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. I realized something pretty quickly after, uh, after I got saved. And I realized that there was no power in my oratory skills or, or my opinions or my thoughts or um, how smart I was or am not. I realized there's no power in any of that. The only power that, that I have is in this book. That's why we have to teach it. We, we have to preach it. We have to exhort with the word of God. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Why did God use this early church so incredibly? Because as my grandmother used to say, man, they loved the good book. They were hungry for the word of God. They loved the Bible. Why is it so important for us to be in the word? Let me just show you a couple of things. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2. It says, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. You know what happens when we read the Bible? We grow. We grow. I believe one of the biggest problems we have in the church today in North America is discipleship. I, I believe it's discipleship. We don't disciple new converts. We don't disciple old converts. We don't disciple people. And we, we, we try really hard to do a good job at that fellowship, picking, although we can grow and get better. I asked my pastor one time, I said, Pastor, who, who, who discipled you? And he said, man, this is going to sound so spiritual, and I don't mean it to come off that way. There's been men who have loved me and have poured into me. 
But he said, the Holy Spirit. I said, the Holy Spirit discipled you? He's a pretty good disciple maker. You know, and, and I started laughing. I said, he is. He's the best disciple maker of all time. How does he grow us? Through his word. Something powerful happens when we open up the Bible. I, I, you don't got to get into a reading plan. You don't got to get into an annual yearly reading plan. You don't got to read 13 chapters a day. Just open it up. Read some of it. I, I mean, sometimes we get the cart before the horse. We try to go to the Bible app and download all these fancy plans and all that kind of stuff. Hey, listen, if you've got the Spirit of God in you, open up the book of Mark or John or somewhere in the Bible and just start to read. And before you read, me and my boys are learning this right now. We always say this prayer together on Thursday nights before we start discipleship. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, lead us. Holy Spirit, teach us from your word. And he always does. He wants that. Did you know that if you don't have a passion or love for the word of God, did you know that's a prayer that he desires to answer in your life? God, help me to have a passion for your word. We grow when we read the Bible. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. What else happens when we read the Bible? We are transformed when we read the Bible. We are transformed. Did you know that when you read the Word of God, when you sit under the teaching of the Word of God, that when you listen to sermons or you play the Bible, I, I like to play the Bible app lately. I like to listen to it in the car. Did you know that when, when you do all those things, it will change you? It'll change the way you think. It'll change the way you act. It'll change the way you treat people. It'll change the way you spend your money. It'll change the way you spend your energy and time. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it changes us. The Bible transforms our lives. It transforms our lives. 1 Timothy 4, 13 through 16. Paul is exhorting his, his young pupil, Timothy, and watch what he tells him. Listen to what he tells him to do. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. He's saying, Timothy, you have the gift to teach the Bible. Teach it. Don't neglect it. And then he says, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. And watch this. He says, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and watch this. And for those who hear you. He, he, he's saying the Bible has to be central. The word of God has to be central in our lives as a church. He's saying we've got to love it. We've got to want it. We've got to desire it. It should be present in our church. You know, I didn't grow up in a church that preached the gospel. Some of you have heard that before. Others haven't. I grew up in the prosperity movement as a poor rural kid from Oklahoma. Can you imagine growing up in that movement in poverty? Every Sunday hearing that the reason why we were poor is because we didn't have enough faith. I grew up in that. Didn't hear the gospel really preached with clarity until I was 15. And we started going to a Baptist church out in the middle of nowhere. And, and I remember for the first time hearing the Bible preached. And then that guy wasn't really, uh, he didn't really preach through the books. He didn't really uh, exposit the word of God. It was topical, but he preached the Bible. And I was just like hungry for it. And then I remember we sat under a, a, a pastor named Mark High School in uh, Claremore, Oklahoma, and he was the first expositor we were ever really exposed to, my wife and I. And I, he would just go through books of the Bible. He would walk through verses like this, and he would teach us the Bible. And there's just so much. It's just like layer after layer after layer and layer of truth. Somebody asked me once, a guest asked me once at Fellowship Pickering, what do you do when you preach all the way through the Bible? And I said, well, well I haven't, I'm, I'm only 38, and I haven't, I've only been preached for 20 years. I haven't done that yet. And he's like, yeah, but what do you do when you do? And I was like, well, man, here's the crazy part. I said, like, I'll get invited to go preach somewhere, and they'll say, Matt, can you preach on um, Timothy chapter 2, for example? And uh, we're doing a series, can you preach on that? And, and I'll say, yeah, sure. And, you know, if my week is insane, I'll, I'll, I'll think, well, I got a, a library of sermons, so I'll go to that section on my computer, and I'll go to Tim, Timothy chapter 2, and, and uh, I'll look at it, and I'll think, well, I can't preach that again, you know? After I pray, the Lord says, I don't, I don't want 
that word for them. And it's not that the Bible passage changed any or nothing like that. It's just that the, the word is alive. And it can mean so many incredible different things for, for, for different congregations. It means one truth, don't get me wrong, but it can have a million applications. This church loved the word of God. Hey, let me ask you a question before we move on today. Do you love the Bible? Do you love the word of God? I, I think there's been times in my life where if I was being honest, I'd say no. I don't. Um, so I, you don't have to a- answer this out loud, obviously. But don't be afraid to say no, you don't today. But if your answer is no, if your response is no, ask God to change that in your heart. Ask him to give you a passion and a zeal for the word of God. They were a saved church. They, they loved the word of God. Thirdly, they were a fellowshipping church. They fellowshiped together. Acts chapter 2, verses 40, verse 42c, it says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. That, that word fellowship in, in the Greek is koinonia, which literally means partnership. Koinonia, partnership or sharing, means that they were together. They, they loved one another. They cared for one another. The early church was a fellowshipping church. They ate meals together. They partied together. They went to kids' birthday parties together. They were in one another's lives. Like, they shared one another's lives. Like, like, like for example, e- even today, there's maybe 50 of us in this room. Like, like, do you know everybody's name in this church? Like, like, honestly. Like, could you just get up and go to somebody and say, Bob, how is your family doing? I, I was joking not too long ago with a pastor because I, in, in like, uh, I'll go to churches and, and people will say, oh, Matt, how are you doing? And I don't remember their names, and they don't do name tags at most churches. I'll say, oh, brother, good to see you, or sister, good to see you, right? But that's like when we're away, but like as a church family, as a church family, we should know each other. Amen? Am I, am I, like, am I, am I crazy here? Like, we should know each other's names. Like, we should know one another's lives. Like, we should know one another's families. The early church was a fellowshipping church. They fellowshiped together. Why? Because they were united. What were they united in? Their political interests? Their hobbies? Their sports? Some of them liked hockey. Others liked lacrosse. Others liked basketball. No, they were united through the powerful, precious blood of Jesus Christ. They fellowshiped around that. You see, what what we do in here on Sundays and what we need to do more of outside of this space in our homes and in our communities is we need to unite around the blood of Christ. There are people that don't have what we have. There are people that can't experience that kind of community that we can experience. They fellowship together because they were in Christ. We need to become a church that is truly a family. Families fellowship. Uh, Some of you may have heard this, others not, but when we first started Fellowship Pickering, this wasn't going to be the original name of the church. We were going to call it Momentum Church. Isn't that a cool name? Momentum Church. And, um, but I don't know, I just, you know, Erica was like, ooh, I don't know about that, you know. She saved me from a lot of bad mistakes over the years. Um, but, But I was convinced it was Momentum Church, and that was a cool name. And so I took a white piece of paper, and I wrote Momentum Church on one side, and I wrote Fellowship Pickering on the other side. And I went into, like, Walmart and uh, Home Depot and Lowe's and all these places. And I just started walking up to people. I said, hey, my name is Matt Hess. I'm starting a church in this community. I say, we're trying to figure out a name. I said, what name do you like best? It was, like, 17 to 2 or, like, 19 to 2, like, for Fellowship Pickering. And uh, they didn't like Momentum Church, Adrian. I don't know why. But, but uh, I, I asked for feedback. I said, what, what, did you, what, did, what did you like about Fellowship? And they all, without a doubt, all of them said, Fellowship speaks of family. Fellowship speaks of getting together, of having common interest around something, what we talked about just now, Christ. And so that's what we went with. We need to eat more meals together. You need to cook more meals for me to come to, you know. (laughs) We got some great opportunities coming up. We're going to do that next Sunday. Man, let's have fun. Bring a guest. Bring a potluck. Or bring a, bring a dish. We'll have a potluck. We'll celebrate. We'll praise God for all he's done. Um, November 8th at the Odena Moran's house. We're going to have a time of prayer and potluck. 
Let's do more of this together. Author and pastor John McCarthy, he says this, The Bible does not envision the Christian life as one lived apart from other believers. All members of the universal church, the body of Christ, are to be actively and intimately involved in local assemblies. He goes on to say, For a Christian to fail to participate in the life of a local church is inexcusable. In fact, those who choose to isolate themselves are disobedient to the direct commands of Scripture. Did you know that in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, And let us not neglect our meeting together. Gather, group, grow, give. Gathering is what we're doing today. We're gathering together. Why? Because Christ commands it. Two more things. They were a saved church. They loved the word of God. They fellowship together. And quickly, we'll run through these last two. They were a Christ-centered church. Acts 2, 42D says, to the breaking of bread. What does that mean here? The breaking of bread. Well, we know later on in verse 46, he talks about how they took meals together and how they broke bread. And so it wouldn't make much sense for the author to keep repeating that, right? And so the breaking of bread is not the same thing as like a potluck meal. What is the breaking of the bread? He's talking about the Lord's Supper. This is what Remember what unified them, what united them. They came together around the, the broken body and the p- spilt blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. You see, at the heart of our gatherings, is it's not just to get together. It's not just to have fun. It's not just to eat. It's about Jesus. We get together for one name, Jesus. We don't even get together for the name of Fellowship Pickering. Fellowship Pickering exists for Jesus The universal church exists for Jesus. And if you have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ alone as Lord and Savior, you exist for the glory of Jesus. This church is to to be bathed, to be clothed, to be washed over and over and over again in Jesus. When somebody comes here and opens up the word of God, Jesus should be present. When we pray before the services start, Jesus is in it. When we pray just a few moments ago, we pray to Jesus in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. When you walk into a church, Jesus should be there. You know why we should feel alive when we come in here on Sunday mornings? You know why we should have energy and excitement and joy? You know why we should have that? Regardless if we, we've had a, a bad week or a broken foot right, or, or whatever it might be, we should have joy. Why? Because we've been bought with the blood of Jesus. Man, we are forgiven. We are redeemed. We've been restored, right? That's a powerful thing. And I think sometimes to bring us back to the simplicity of church, we forget that we are a part of something that is unworldly. We are a part of a movement. We exist for the glory of King Jesus. The early church was a Christ-centered church. You see, something powerful happens at the Lord's table. You know why when we take the Lord's Supper and we admonish you, hey, don't take it lightly. Don't, Don't just go into it. The Lord's Supper is a memorial, right? It's a memorial to Jesus. But you know what else the Lord's Supper does? Talking about unity as a body, it unifies us. You know how it unifies us? Because if there's things in our hearts, if there's bad motives or, or sin or whatever it might be, Paul tells us in the Corinthians, he says, examine yourself before you take the supper. And so when you pause and you examine yourself and you ask the Holy Spirit to examine your heart, you confess sin, you repent of it. Guess what? And then you take the Lord's Supper. You've been purified. You're cleansed. You're clean. And the brother next to you is clean and the sister next to you is clean. And we're unified again. Right? Around what? 
Around what? Our socioeconomic differences? Our age? Our retirement? What? No, Jesus. Jesus. That's why the church is so beautiful. That's why the church is unlike anything else. Because we focus and we center everything around Jesus. Finally today, what else did this church do? They were a praying church, man. They were a praying church. It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to what? Say it, church. Prayer. Hey, raise your hand if you have a tough time praying sometimes. I'm going to raise, I'm going to raise both my hands. Man, we all struggle with prayer. I think if there's one area I've always felt inadequate in, in my relationship with God, it's prayer. I, I, I'm always trying to grow and learn more about prayer and dig in more about prayer. You know why it's so hard? You know why it's so hard to pray? Because Satan hates it when we pray. He will, listen, listen to me. He will do anything to keep you from praying. The enemy will do anything to keep you from praying. He will do anything to keep you from God's word. And he does. Can I get a witness? He does. You know, I, I get up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat Cadence up this morning. You get up at 4 a.m. Cadence decided to get up at a quarter till 4, right? She, she wants to get up at 345 that day, right? Oh, well, you know what? I'm, the, the house is quiet. You know, I'm going to, you know, and, and uh, I'm going to put my phone away. You know, I'm going to put my phone in another room, not even going to mess with it, right? And I, I, I pray for a little bit of time. I feel so refreshed. I go back there, and my phone's got 32 text messages and this crisis and that, and th this answer, I need this answer and this response and everything, and it just it beats you down. It wears you out. Satan will do anything to keep us from praying. You know what the really bad news is? Oftentimes, we just capitulate. Father God in heaven, uh, well, I wonder what's going on on my Instagram today, you know. Lord Jesus, I just come to you today. Uh, tw my Twitter's blowing up. God, hold on one second. I, you know, I, I wish I could say I was joking, but, man, I'm guilty of doing that sometimes. I'm guilty of giving more time and energy and focus to my family and to this church and to my ministry than I am Jesus. Now, how insane is that, what I just now said? Because my family will never be the family. I will never be the leader. This church will never be the church. This network will never be the network. Unless I'm pressing into God every single day in prayer. And I just want to say this. We will never become the church that God's asked us to become. Unless we become a praying church. John 14, 13 through 14. Here, I, you know what? I just want to remind us as we wrap up today. I just want to remind us that God is for you and he loves you. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Why does he do it? Just to answer your prayer? No, he does it to glorify the, the, the Father. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Romans 12, 12. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. In Luke 18, 1 through 8, there's this incredible parable that I was reading in my quiet time this week. And <laughs> I love it. There's this uh, persistent uh, lady, and uh, she's a widow, and she keeps on going to this judge. And verse 2 of Luke 18 says the judge didn't fear God, didn't respect man, and uh, she keeps on going to him, and he just keeps refusing. And finally he says this. He says, even though I do not fear God or respect men, yet because this widow keeps on pestering me, I will give her justice. Then she will stop wearing me out for her perpetual request. And the Lord said, listen to the words of the unjust judge. Will not God bring about justice for his elect, those who are born again, who cry out to him day and night? Will he continue to defer their help? I tell you, he will promptly carry out justice on their behalf. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Man, as we close today, there is this disturbing trend that I am seeing in the church today. And it is this. It's especially in young men. Especially in young men. We have forgotten the love of the Father. We are so caught up and we are so 
wrapped up in his wrath and his justice and, and ugh, that we always view God as angry. We always view God as like up there just waiting to condemn us, waiting to get on us, waiting to, 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 to slap us around. And we forget he loves us. You say, well, how do you know that? Because the Bible says he loved us so much, he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. And whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves us. You say, what's that have to do with prayer? You know why we don't pray? Because we don't really think God loves us. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out how to spend more quality time in prayer and just be more disciplined. God just says, come spend time with me. God help us. Sienna, last night, she uh, was at a girlfriend's house this weekend, and she said, um, Daddy, can I just come sit with you? I said, of course. She just wants to sit by her dad. I mean, we overthink it. Simple church. <laughs> Simple church. We overthink it. It's not about big buildings. It's not about lights. It's not about flash. It's not about how good a preacher or whatever. It's about are we opening up the word of God and are we getting a word from God? Is the spirit with us or is he not? Is God for us or is he not? I, I believe that we are entering into an exciting season into the life of this church. I, I believe that if we would be a saved church, a fellowshipping church, a praying church, a church that loved the word of God, a church that was Christ-centered in everything that we said and did. Man, I believe God would do something. I believe God would pour his blessings out upon us. And I believe that we would be an incredible, incredible movement for the glory of God. We've got to pray more. We've got to pray before church, 10 a.m. every Sunday. Moran and Erica are in the back. Sometimes others, if we have time, back and we pray. I want to encourage you, go back there and pray with them. We're going to try to get creative in finding new ways to pray and asking God to do more in the life of this church. I want to share something very personal with you. And then we're going to pray. Almost 10 years ago, I was sitting in my office at a church I was pastoring in northwest Mississippi outside of Memphis, Tennessee. And I was preaching through the book of Acts. I preached through this book for two and a half years. God help those people. I mean, they're probably still trying to recover right, <laughs> from those sermons. But I preached through that book for two and a half years. Let me tell you what God did. Through that book, through this book, he called us to church planting. He, he just began to say, like, I, the more I read about what was going on in this and the more I saw what, what was going on in the church I was leading, I was like, something's not lining up here. Something's not lining up. But here we are. We're a baby church. You know that, right? Like we're an infant church. We, we're just getting started. God's used this church in so many incredible ways. And what I believe and what, what I discern is that God is trying to get our attention. And I know it's long weekend. I know it's Thanksgiving weekend. There's others who are away today. But, but I believe God's trying to get our attention. I, I believe he's trying to, hey, 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 let's, let's focus on these things. Let, let's bring it back to the basics. Let's, let's bring it back to being a family. Let's bring it back to crying together, laughing together, loving one another. Let, let's bring it back to fellowshipping together. Let's make sure I'm always present, Jesus is saying. Let, let, let's make sure that, 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 that we're praying together. Let, let's make sure that this book is, is, is our final authority in everything that we say and do. Let's make sure that this Bible is always here. And I, I, remember, I remember thinking in my office, man, if I ever planted a church, I would love for it to look like this. And, you know, we're, we're doing these tables and we're going to keep on. I believe that there's some ways and some areas that we need to get healthy in. And I think great things happen at tables. And I think we can talk more, we can fellowship more, and we can be more united. Hey, let me say this to you. 
I really, really love everybody. Love each and one, every one of you again. And I also want to say this. If you got questions for me, if you, if you say, hey, Matt, I got this idea. I, I think this would be really great. Text me. Email me. Do all that kind of stuff. And it'd be a really, really good time. Um, I went way over today on my time, but we got started a little bit late. I'm not going to feel too bad. Um, I'll apologize to kids workers. Let's do this today. We're, we're going to forego the final song. We're going to invite everybody to stand up. Go ahead and stand up right now. And we're going to fellowship in just a moment. But I want you to look at the screen. We have a closing prayer. Should have a close. There we go. So we're going to say this together, all right? We're going to say this together. And as we say this together, let's, in our minds and in our hearts, let's ask the Lord these things, okay, that we're going to pray. All right, on three, and then we're going to start saying it loudly, okay? One, two, this is prayer to God. One, two, three. May the love of Jesus Christ bring us wholeness. The grace of God the Father grant us peace the breath of the Holy Spirit instill passion and the unity between them give us strength for this and every day until we gather again to worship. Amen. Father God, thank you for these people. Thank you, God, for your work today. Thank you for what you've done. And God, I pray that this would be the first step of a new day in the life of our church. I pray, God, that you would grow us closer together through your word, that we would pray together as a church family that, Christ, you would be central in our lives. God, that we would long for you. Holy Spirit, empower us, anoint us, and fill us for your glory. And, God, as we fellowship together today, let us grow closer to you first and to one another secondarily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have a challenge for you. If there's somebody in this room that you don't know, go introduce yourself. Tell them about who you are, your family, and your Thanksgiving plans. Okay? Let's do that right now.